Um, so I'm a technologist. I'm a technologist that happens to specialize in security. And if I look about how you can best do security, I look at how you can best do technology and in terms of how you can best do that for your organization. And that doesn't matter if your organization is a school, uh, a business, a global bank. It really doesn't matter. It all comes down to the same things about how do you lead effective technology teams and effective technology projects. And TJ talks about, a lot about innovation. And I've worked at some very interesting, and some would say uh, innovative, um, companies. And Skype was certainly one of those. But I'm going to go a little bit further back. So I started coding when I was about 13 years old. So I learned how to do basic and I started reading books and sort of being taught little bits from magazines and things that I could find on how to actually make very simple games at the time. And I kind of evolved into learning more about um, databases and concepts of how computers process data um, as, I, as I got older. So my son, who's now 15, when he was about 13, he said, oh, Daddy, why don't you teach me to code? I always see you coding, uh, but you've never taught me how to code. Why don't you teach me? So I said, OK, but the first thing you need to do is, as much like TJ's innovation scenario, is you've got to define what it is you're going to do. Just at a high level, a broad concept, you know, is it a game, is it a, an app, what's it going to do, what's the purpose of it? And so he thinks about that and he goes away and he comes back and he has a bit of an outline. And I say, OK, well, how's that going to work? You know, not in terms of how do you program it, but what is it you've got to do, what's the user flow, what's the user experience like? And trying to get him to start thinking, much like I was never taught, but how to actually think about the user first. So user-centric design as a principle. So we did all this and, and we went through it and we worked on it for, for quite a few hours over a number of weeks. And at the end of it, I was like, okay, great, let's start learning how to program. And I taught him some basics and, and sort of left him to, to work on that and gave him the resources. And, and about a week later, I went back to him and said, oh, how are you getting on with your game? He said, oh, it's great. And he shows me this thing. And I'm amazed. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's like, wow, you, you're, you're a genius. You're a prodigy. He goes, yes, it was great. I, I took the spec that we did, and I outsourced it online. <laughs> um, and for $50, I was able to get this entire prototype made for me. And from this, I've been able to start customizing it and moving it on. And this taught me two things. One, that I was paying him far too much allowance. Um, but, but the other, that actually the world has changed. The world has changed around us. And about leveraging skill sets and leveraging what you're best at is going to be very different for him than it was for me at that age, and indeed, hopefully, for his children in time. So I looked at him, I looked at what I could learn from him about that, and it was one of the first um, occasions that I learned something about computing or technology from him about leveraging, leveraging strengths. I think actually being, a, being an effective manager is so much about being an effective parent as well, so I learned a lot about managing from being a parent from when he was younger, certainly patience. Um, but trying to actually get to the point that I could learn technology things from him was, it was a revolution for me. Now fast forward a couple of years and he's now learning computing in, in school. And this is very interesting to me, and he's got a physics teacher that's teaching them computing, and I looked at the syllabus, and I thought, that's quite interesting, they're, they're teaching them to code some things in it. And then I realized that the teacher's learning how to program themselves the hour before the lesson. I, I'm being a little cruel, and I know there's a number of <laughs> teachers in, in the room, but because the teacher was never taught how to program, or if they were, it was in a language that's very far removed from where they are today, um, trying to then teach, there's a big disconnect there. So I've been looking at these number of things, and, and one of the things that um, I was very um, keen at at Microsoft, and it's now public so I can talk about it, is this thing called Touch Develop. And it was about taking that user-driven design. It's about taking how users um, will experience the product and then building from that down. So instead of starting at the very bare bones and working up, it's about starting at how the UX needs to look. And I don't mean the colors. I just mean the flow and, and the sort of approach. And much like Apple, you know, their philosophy and Johnny's philosophy is very much more user-centric design. I take that approach in security-centric design as well. And I like that some of the new products available, Scratch is another one by MIT, it's not just Microsoft that's been doing this, that actually has given us new tools that we can use for our children and for our staff. In, in my organization, I've got about 1,000 people. Many of them don't code. And, and I look at them and I go, well, how are you trying to work with people that do develop and do code if you can't understand what it is they're trying to achieve or how they go about it? So I encourage adults and children, and certainly parents of children that are learning this, to start using some of these tools themselves so they can get experience with them. 
So I tried this with some of my teams, and, and I've worked at different companies, and as they briefly mentioned, I've worked kind of in banking. Um, so I worked at Hedge Fund, three, three investment banks now, um, and now HSBC. And I've worked in various tech companies, so Betfair, Skype, and, and Skype was so unpopular, I mean, it was sold first of all to eBay, and then to a private equity, and finally to Microsoft. So it was one company, but three different owners. But in those companies, they all had something in common, that they were all trying to deliver a product. And what was very apparent was from the mind of the product designer or whatever product uh, manager you want to call it, of having an idea to actually getting something enjoyed by the users, delighted by the users, consumed by the users, whatever you want to call it. There was various paths in between. In technology companies, they always try to have that as small as possible. In very governance heavy companies like banking, they always try to have that path as long as possible. Uh, and I look at it and I look, you're both trying to do fundamentally the same things. And I'm very strange, and I'm very happy to admit this, but I enjoy both companies. And the reason I enjoy both companies is I try to change both companies to be like the other. And by starting at the two extremes, when they come together closer to the middle, actually it's much more enjoyable for me. And as I'm happy in the middle, I'm, I'm happy to bring them there as well. So in the tech companies, they talked about governance being a bad thing. Uh, the fact that you know, Google wasn't a corporate. Of course Google's a corporate. It's, it's, it's just a very large corporate that's specializing in developing software, but it's still a corporate. It's still a corporation. It's still an enterprise. And then I go to the banks and I say, well, where's the innovation? And much like TJ was talked about, you know, trying to foster that environment for, for innovation. And you go to them and say, well, okay, you can have you know, your day a month or whatever it is. And it's more than that, and that's what TJ was, was, was ending with. It's about fostering that throughout everything that you do from day to day. And we're really bad at teaching our leaders and teaching our technologists how to be good technology leaders, but actually just good leaders. When I was 25, something like that, I was sent on a management course, on a leadership course. And they're like, great, you're now managing a team. You need to be shown how to do that. I was like, OK, this should be interesting. So I went on this course. And it's always good, team building and so on. But one of the tasks they gave us that's really stuck with me to this day is they were given with this challenge. We're in a field, much, much like outside here, and there's this tree, and there was this rope that was hanging down from the tree. And under the rope, there was a, there was a square, and there's something hanging on the end of the rope. And we were given a load of material, and we were told, don't go into the square, but you've got to get the thing hanging off the end of the rope. And we're like, OK, any other constraints? Nope, that's it. So you know, problem set, problem we're solving, maybe. But certainly, we were given the challenge of the four of us in the team. So we're like, OK, four of us, square has four corners, one to each corner, pick up the square, move it out of the way, walk to the bottom of the rope, put the square back. OK, fine. We then sent somebody up the tree to untie the rope. No, no, that no, wasn't allowed either. We, we then started using the pieces of wood that we'd been given to start trying to hit the um, thing at the bottom of the rope to swing it towards us, nearly decapitating the person on the other side trying to catch it. As we went, that was also off limits. So then they eventually said, just build the bloody bridge, will you? And it taught me that sometimes you're not, it's not just enough to give people the, the end goal. So they wanted us to achieve a goal, but they really cared about how we went about it. And notwithstanding that I didn't particularly enjoy that course and didn't learn a lot from it, I learned a lot from what not to do. So I learned that if, if I really care about not just the goal, but also how they go about it, then I need to communicate that. I need to ensure that people understand that they want to do that. If I want my data protected, I want to communicate how that data should be used. Um, so, for instance, if I say go and secure your data, and, and often people in the business come to me and they say, right, we have no tolerance for any data loss. And I'm saying, okay, well, I'm going to take all your data, I'm going to put it on a hard drive, I'm going to put that in the safe, and then I'm going to throw it to the bottom of the ocean. That's as close to secure as we will ever get. It's completely useless. And that's in business. Business is not about being completely secure. There's no such thing as 100% security. It's about managing risk. The other end of the spectrum with my data is putting it onto a server and putting that wide open to the internet. Well, that's crazy. It's going to be hacked, it's going to be stolen and taken offline and all the rest of it. So somewhere in between is my risk appetite. And teaching people not just go and secure my data, go and secure my system and build me all these cool things, but now it's about build this product, this feature, whatever it is, and do it in a secure way. I learned a lot about 10 years ago that I needed to start communicating better with the developers. We had a, a big challenge at Skype on scale. We were doing you know, millions and millions of users, 50 million concurrent online users. At the time, we were bigger than Facebook, so you know, they've overtaken us, taken them somewhat by now. But at the time, we had this huge problem of scale. And one of the things we didn't do was sit there and say, right, you must, when you're developing whatever application you're developing, do it according to these uh, security policy. Here, slap, you know, big wadge of paper. Governance with a, very, excuse me, with a very big G at the beginning of it. 
No, we worked with them and said, look, you've got to solve this problem of scale. We want to help influence that. And we're going to do it together in a secure way. So we solved that problem of scale. And having solved that problem of scale, we didn't then think every day, wow, we've got to overcome this problem of scale. We've got to overcome this problem of scale. We thought about now we're going to use that as a design pattern. And we started using that in many different areas and including teams. And one of the things that I found that as we get from um, technology design patterns, we often forget the teams. So you can solve a technical problem. You put enough technical people in a room, double that number, and that's the number of technical solutions you've come out, from, out of that room. But you've, you've not solved your business problem, and you've not solved the delivery problem. And the delivery problem is where I try to focus. So if I have a team that is going to be delivering a new product, a new project, whatever it is, I try and get them as highly aligned as possible, but as loosely coupled to every other team around them. So when they're delivering their capabilities into, let's say, into you know, investment making, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. The point is that I will let them, much as TJ does with his separate teams, I will let them go in the direction with very loose oversight over what they're doing. And, and as, as he said, you know, having them consult with me is, is important, but whoever they need to consult with. But having that highly aligned and loosely coupled was the same thing that we did when we were trying to solve technology scale. So we were trying to scale to millions and millions of users, and we had to have environments and data centers and whatever you want to call them that scale horizontally. And then I realized I had to have that with my teams as well. I couldn't have, and the very classic way of building teams is the pyramid structure. Um, the very classic way of building systems and data um, access is also in the very pyramid structure. You have something at the front that everybody goes to to get information, and whether that's a person or a computer, that's the very classic way, uh, uh, um, an hourglass, if you will, of actually trying to get access to that data. So then we start scaling the teams differently. So I started building these teams in differently, and I started thinking differently about how I built these teams. One of the teams I built, I, actually by accident, had a huge array of diversity. Now, by diversity, yes, I mean gender, yes, I mean ethnicity, but I also mean companies that they had worked for previously. And that third dimension was one that had never struck me before. I had never realized it. And having worked now in both tech and banking, I was very aware of it when I actually came and stumbled across it accidentally. So I had this team that was the most high performing out of all of my 10 teams, and it was the most high performing, and I couldn't work out why. And I looked at it, and I wondered if it was the gender balance within it, and, and I was going through it, and I talked about to them about how they were doing, you know, delivering their products in, in a different way to all the other nine teams. And they came back with, well, you set us the task we need to achieve, and you know, some loose parameters, and we're doing that. We don't understand. What are we doing wrong? Why are you asking us these questions? And it was trying to flip it back about saying, no, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you what you're doing wrong. It's what I can learn from you. And this belief that you can only learn from the people above you is very strange. Um, but it's one that we're taught when we all, as children, sit in a classroom, and the person at the front is the one telling us the answers. They are the authority figure. And we need to start breaking that up. And we need to start, whether it's in the classroom or in the enterprise, getting to the point where we have these little pods of people, little pods, you can call them teams if you want, in a classroom, in, in an office, it doesn't matter. And they learn from one another as much as they learn from an oversight figure, a teacher, uh, a manager, and CEO, it doesn't really matter. Then they can learn as much from that person as they can from each other. And that really was the biggest learning I took out of that one very highly performing team. I will just end this by talking a little bit about security, as I, as I promised to do so. One of the things that uh, is very interesting about um, credit cards and, and crash numbers is there's a PIN number, and everybody knows the PIN number is four digits. You may not know why the PIN number was four digits. So the, the engineer that um, actually came up with this went home and, and asked his wife, how many numbers can you reasonably be expected to remember? She said six, and then thought about it for a bit more, and then said four. So that was where the number got set from. It's, it's probably a good job that uh, his wife wasn't Carol Vorderman, otherwise we'd have a 20-digit <laughs> digit PIN today. But that made me think, again, we've not thought about what we're trying to achieve. And if you look at security user experiences today, they are fundamentally broken. A password is the worst possible thing we could have protecting our sensitive data. In the world of biometrics, in the world of this thing called two-factor authentication, so it's not just something I know, which would be a password, but it's something I am, biometric, something I have, maybe a, a physical device or token. This two-factor, two out of those, um, is really the way to go. And one of the things that really has perplexed me is there's been so much reticent to move away from passwords. 
And again, I look back at this and I think, actually, it's because it's what we've been taught. It's been what we've been taught all the way back to school, all the way back even before that, when if you wanted access to your favorite toy, you had to you know, have permission from, from a mother or whatever it is. There's still a access point at which you needed to overcome, and the password seems to be synonymous with that. So one of the things I actively will be doing, and you'll see it if you are a HSBC banking customer, is I will be getting rid of every single password there is. If you're a customer, you won't be using it. If you're an employee, you won't be using it because it's just not strong enough. We need better than that. And this is one of the ways in which I'm going to lead innovation inside, inside the bank. I've been there nine months, so it's still very early days. But I'm going to lead innovation inside the bank. And I'm not going to be afraid to try, and I'm not going to be afa afraid to fail. And fail is an interesting word. But as long as you're failing forwards and failing forwards faster, just to complete the alliteration, you're actually doing a very um, good thing for the company. You do it in the right ways. You don't do it with all your critical, you know, most sensitive data or whatever it is. But you do it with an area that it's okay to fail in. And you get that iteration going and you get it going step by step by step. And eventually you get to the point that you've actually reached a step you'd never believed you'd reach to in a time you'd never believed you'd reach because you've just done that iteration. And you can call it agile if you will. But the point of trying to do that step by step failing forwards means that if you actually make a step that's wrong and you need to correct, it's only this much that you need to correct. Previously, you would do these huge two, three year projects and you would get to the end of them and you would realize that actually, you know, a half year in we should have canned the project. That's hugely expensive. So by trying innovation, and I'm putting this bold statement out there, a real problem that needs to be solved and challenging my team to, to help me solve it and to solve it for me in, in many cases. Of let's get rid of passwords and whatever in your respective organizations, be it education or, or corporates, setting those goals, giving people things to aspire to, and then creating the environment in which they can do that is all I need to do. And I say all, it's a huge thing and it's all each of us needs to do. And whether that's building a team with the right um, split of genders, diversities, ethnicities, and cultures of, of companies, um, or whether it's giving them the time to work on it and the ability to feel they fail, they can fail, and it's then not going to be punished like a blame culture. That will be, I will change the bank, I will revolutionize the bank. And I'm not going to take all credit, there's going to be many other people going to be working with me in doing this. And it's one of the things that we did previously at Skype, and, and I like to say that, you know, I manage a team of people and I get out of their way. That's my job as, as a manager, as, as a leader. But it's one of the things that every company can do, and it's learn not, you don't have to have huge scale in order to do it. You can be whatever size you want, whatever size you are, and you can affect that change from within. But you have to try, and you have to be willing and embrace failure. There's a, a quote from somebody at IBM um, made uh, 30 years ago, and they said that they were going to punish mediocre improvement and reward outstanding failure. It's an odd concept, but the point is if you try and aim for, let's say, the moon, if you want to like, aim for Mars, you might get to the moon, which seems very appropriate after the previous um, um, talk. So aim for Mars, settle for the moon. If you aim for the moon, you're going to hit London from here. I might use a different one elsewhere. And the point is you have to try and you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Now, how does that apply to security? In every single way. So whether it's trying to protect data, whether it's trying to scale data, scale teams, deliver more you know, secure banking transactions, I have to create an environment in which the the is willing, is, I'm okay for them to fail. I'm willing to let them try things. I'm willing to invest in education. I'm willing to challenge them so that they can do more and accept that if they don't get it right the first time, I'm not going to fire them. And it's a very hard lesson for them to learn. And it's a very hard lesson as a manager to reward outstanding failure and punish mediocre success. Thank you.